Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming to the Data Colada Seminar Series. I'm Leif Nelson, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Berkeley Dietvorst. In addition, we'll be joined by four panelists, uh, Jason Dana, Ellen Avers, Lynn Fay, and Uma Karmarker. As always, we're joined uh, today with by Joe Simmons and Yuri Simonson, uh, who will be contributing in the, as panelists as well. Uh, for those of you who've done this before, the last part you already know, but uh, for those unfamiliar, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. During Berkeley's presentation, you can submit uh, questions or comments that will get read by all of the panelists, uh, probably not by Berkeley because he'll be busy, but most notably his co-author Lynn is here, and so she might be able to answer some straightforward questions, and the rest of us can help funnel questions to Berkeley as needed. So. With all of that aside, uh, Berkeley, the floor is yours. Awesome, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, really excited to share this work with everyone and get comments. So this is still something we're actively working on. And so any thoughts or comments are really helpful as we progress through this research. It's a project, as Leif said, with Lynn, who you can see hopefully in the panel here. And it's really a project about decision-making under risk and uncertainty, and prediction. So let's think about evaluating prospects from the perspective of most theories and models of decision under risk. Typically in these theories and models, risk preferences are defined over prospects, which are the material outcomes and associated probabilities that you can realize when you partake in a decision under risk. Right, so in other words, people's preferences are completely defined in these theories and models over what you stand to gain or lose materially and what the probabilities of those gains and losses are. Kind of going hand in hand with this, many researchers have studied risk preferences with purely monetary prospects. Right, so you can see some examples from prospect theory here and what we're really asking participants to choose between are distributions of gains here or distributions of losses. And you can see how these really match up and go hand in hand. In our theories, the only inputs into people's decisions are distributions of gains and losses. And then when we're studying risk, we do so by having people choose between distributions of gains and losses. And you, so you can really see how these match up and how this makes a ton of sense. One thing I'd wanna consider though, when we look at the real world, most real world prospects, at least that I see, are not purely monetary or purely material. There's more context than that. There's more going on. And so there's a question about, is some of that context consequential? And perhaps are other outcomes beyond these monetary or material outcomes actually consequential outcomes of these choices? And so we're going to bring up one of those factors today that we think is a part of real world decisions under risk, but not part of our theories or stimuli necessarily yet, and study and see if that's important. So specifically, we're going to propose to you that real world decisions under risk pretty much always involve prediction, right? And this is because the outcomes of real world prospects are usually inextricably tied to future states of the world. So when we look out at real world decisions under risk, people are not just selecting distributions of gains or losses, they're typically selecting an outcome and along with that outcome comes a distribution of gain or loss. So to make this really concrete and give you examples, if you want to bet on a baseball game, you're not just buying a distributions of gains, you're going to bet that something specific is going to happen, like this team will win or this many runs will be scored. And if that future state of the world is realized, then you're going to get money, otherwise you might lose money. When you invest in a stock or a fund or partake in a prediction market, you are choosing some future state of the world, right? This asset increasing in value, this prediction coming true, and how much you gain or lose is going to depend on that future state of the world and whether it happens or not, right? You're not just buying abstracts, distributions of gains and losses. When you're playing any kind of game in Vegas or gambling, right? You're not just buying a distribution of gains. You're often always, or always, I think, picking an outcome. Right, so what the die is going to land on, what the roulette wheel is going to land on, et cetera. And even when you're doing things like playing a slot machine or using a scratch lottery ticket, the condition of you gaining or losing money depends on some future state of the world, whether that pull the lever leads to the right outcome on the slot machine or that ticket that you're scratching is a winner or a loser. 
right? So for all of these, you can't really participate unless you pick a future state of the world, right? Picking a future state of the world is really part of being part of this decision under risk. And so one thing we're going to propose to you is that means that real world prospects produce prediction errors, right? So if I have to select a future state of the world, when I enter into a real world decision under risk, now that future state of the world is either going to be realized or not. And I'm going to realize a prediction error, which is just the difference between what I predicted and what happened, right? So if I predict there's going to be at least 10 runs scored in a baseball game, and there's only eight scored, I might face a prediction error of two. If I take a certain bet in a prediction market and the other outcomes realized, I might be wrong instead of right. And if my outcomes realized, I'm right instead of wrong. And so what we're really proposing and what this whole project is about is that people may treat prediction errors themselves as consequential outcomes in these decisions under risk, right? So people's utility and people's preferences are not just over the distributions of gains and losses that they face, right? Whether I lost $5 or won $10, the prediction error that I realize and how well my prediction or my selected future state of the world pans out directly enters into my utility, right? So I face utility over that. So to make this really concrete, let's think about just this example of Jim choosing among prospects. Let's say that we have two different prospects he could enter into. The one on the left here, Jim learns that if he correctly predicts the outcome of a six-sided die roll, he'll win $25. And if he's incorrect, he's going to lose $5, right? So a pretty straightforward decision under risk. And let's compare that and contrast that with one where Jim's told he just has a one six chance of gaining $25 and a five six chance of losing $5, right? Would you like to accept this prospect or not? Obviously, when it comes to the material outcomes that Jim's going to realize, these two things are identical, right? So for both of them, Jim has a one six chance of getting $25 and a five six chance of losing $5. We think that the reason they're different is because in the left, we understand that the outcome is associated or tied to a future state of the world, right? Jim correctly picking this die roll. And so we think in the decision on the left, Jim is actually going to realize two outcomes instead of just one, right? So if Jim bets six and the die lands on four, we think that Jim not only realized this material outcome of losing $5, he also realized this prediction error of being off by two, right? On the right-hand side, we think when this gamble plays out, Jim just only realizes one outcome, right? He hasn't selected a future state of the world. He's just said, I accept this prospect. And now if Jim loses or gets the worst outcome, he's just going to face a loss of $5, right? So our guy, sorry, go ahead. Can I ask a question for clarification? Because in both cases, like, in, oh, sorry, Omar, I didn't realize you also wanted to ask. <laughs> no, you heard. Um, uh, in both cases, you seem to at least predict some future state of the world, uh, at least on the right, like whether it's mm -hmm. worth taking this gamble or not. But the big difference between the two is that on the left, you're in control of the specific prediction. And on the right, you just, if anything, you make an average prediction. So is it really about considering the future state of the world or feeling like you have control over which specific future state of the world is important? So we don't think it's just about having control over the future state of the world. And we're gonna hopefully show you some studies that convince you of that. Um, we think it's really about specifying a specific future state of the world when you're making this choice. Now, I completely understand your argument of, aren't you kind of abstractly doing that in the gamble on the right? That could be the case. Then I think you're also doing it in the gamble on the left and you're doing it either to a larger magnitude or selecting two states of the world on the left, where in both of them, you might be saying, I think this future state will be realized where I win. But on the left, you're also saying specifically, I think the dial land on six. And so there could be a marginal effect of specifying that as well, if you want to think about it that way. All right, so Sorry. Is, is, is that good? Does that answer the question? Uma, you had a question, right? I had a question as well. Go ahead. Um, so uh, I'm curious about, from the prediction error standpoint, I'm curious about an error of two as opposed to an error versus getting it correct, since there's not like monotonicity in the roll of a dice, you know, mm -hmm. or a die, sorry. Absolutely. So I think that's really an open question. That's something we've run some studies on. So actually with 
we run as a anecdote asking people, what do you think about different errors with the die roll? And they do actually see differences beyond just getting it right or getting it wrong. They care a little bit about how far off they are. But even if they didn't, that's actually fine for us. So in this project, we're going to say, we have some idea what that penalty function might look like or what their preferences over error might be. But the main point of this project is that it matters. And so if, even if it's just binary, I'm right or I'm wrong, our hypothesis is really when we add that to a decision under risk, it changes people's preferences and it matters. I'm hoping we can do more research and iron out exactly what that utility or penalty function looks like and be able to tell you exactly what it is in certain contexts. But hopefully the takeaway from today is no matter what it is, in some cases it could be binary and others it could have more levels, it matters and it affects people's decision. making. All right, so yeah, our whole proposal here is that Jim might actually make different choices and have different preferences in these because he realizes an additional potentially consequential outcome on the left, right? So if realizing this error of two, Jim inherently cares about his prediction and if he's right or wrong, and that affects his utility, he could actually make a different decision in the gamble on the left versus the right, even though the material outcomes are the same, right? So when we think about our theories of decision under risk that really just think about preferences over distributions and material outcomes and the stimuli we commonly use, that might not be what you'd predict, right? You might, you might predict that people might make the same choice. So we can think about, as we talked about a little bit already, what might people's value function over error be, right? How might people think about air and different levels of air. Largely, I think this is an open question, but we can turn to a little bit of my research to figure out, at least getting us started, what might this look like? Um, and so I have some other research with another great PhD student at Booth, in addition to my co-author, Lynn, uh, Sohan Barty, where we find that people have diminishing sensitivity to forecasting air, right? So all this means it's about people's penalty function or utility function over air. And all the diminishing sensitivity means is that each marginal unit of error that you realize affects you less and less and less, right? So going from a perfect prediction to being off by one feels like a really big change. Going from off by one to off by two feels a little smaller. Going from off by two to off by three feels a little bit smaller than that, right? So this tells us what people's penalty function could look like. It could look like this curve here. So on the x-axis, we have the magnitude of error that you make. On the y-axis, we have disutility. So all I mean that to say is it's utility backwards. Higher numbers, I mean, higher on the, on the y-axis is less utility, lower is more utility. I don't mean all the numbers are negative, right? But all that this function means is relative to a perfect prediction with zero error, that first unit of error affects me the most, the next unit of error affects me a little less, the next unit affects me a little less, to when I'm thinking about making an error of 30 versus 31, those might not even really feel like different outcomes to me. Those might feel pretty much the same. So, Can I ask a question for clarification? Absolutely, go ahead. So this is the degree of error with exactly the same outcomes. So if I lose because I'm off by one versus I lose because I'm off by two versus I lose because I'm off by three. Right? This like the outcomes error, so the, the way we're, that's a great question. We're thinking of, the way we're thinking about this is you have a value function over the material outcomes, like for example, the prospect theory value function. And that's just a separate thing. So when you gain or lose money or material outcomes, concert tickets, right, whatever it is of value, you're going to feel like that, maybe like the prospect theory value function says. That's not represented here. That's just a separate thing. So you have these preferences over gains and losses. That's been studied a lot. There's tons of papers on that. That exists and that's over somewhere else. You have this preference function over air. So you're going to realize things in terms of air. And this is how we think you feel about that. And then when you face a prospect where you realize both the material outcomes and the error, your preference is going to be an aggregation of these somehow. So we'll take your valuation from the prospect theory function or whatever theory you like. We'll take your valuation of the error and we'll jam those together in some way to get your overall preference. That's, that's the idea. Super clear, thanks. So the, way, the reason we care about this function and the reason I'm even bringing it up is that this diminishing sensitivity makes people risk seeking. So it tells us how people might think about air in terms of risk. So we can see that people are risk seeking with a really simple example here. Let's imagine that we take this person with this penalty function or utility function, whatever you wanna call it. 
and give them a choice. You can make an error of two for certain, right? So you're going to make a prediction and you'll be off by two for sure. Or you'll have a 50% chance of being perfect and a 50% chance of being off by four, right? So how would this person think about this? This person would actually prefer the risky prospect, even though they have the same expected value of two error, because in expectation, that would give them more utility or less disutility than the certain prospect of two error for sure. And why is this? It's specifically because of this diminishing sensitivity, right? It's because relative to perfection, four feels less than twice as bad as two, right? So being off by four feels being less than twice as bad as being off by two relative to zero, right? So this is just the basis for our prediction that when people are evaluating air and thinking about their preferences over air, they're gonna be really risk seeking. And so if we had a prospect that was just prediction and all people are realizing is air, they're going to be really risk seeking, right? We also can look to the literature to know what might be people's preferences over gains, for example. The literature suggests people should be really risk averse over gains. And so what would we expect and to see in a prospect where you might realize gains and air, your risk preference might fall somewhere in between those as you aggregate these two valuations. Quickly, I'm wondering Quickly. if there's an alternative uh, no, way. Ahead. Sorry, if there's an alternative way to think about this, which is that, like my intuition is that Z zero error is not an is not merely an absence of disutility. Zero error is bragging rights. So, so basically, if I have a chance for zero error, I have a chance for maybe even a massive amount of positive utility. And so they aren't even really like comparing two error versus fifty percent zero, fifty percent four might not even be equivalent because zero error is actually like super positive. Yeah. So I think I mean one way you could see that is there could be a giant discontinuity that would look something really like the steep curve. So there could be a big step. I think that's absolutely, we can't, we have some research looking at this penalty function and we can't rule out that it's a step versus a steep curve. So absolutely, you're right. And what I, I was worried people would be confused about this. When I write disutility here, I'm not saying negative utility. I just wanted to show you that the y-axis is backwards. So I do think absolutely zero error of perfect prediction that gives you positive utility and you love that. It's not a negative thing or, or neutral, right? If you bet on the baseball game and you're right, you're really happy. In some cases, even if you have a near miss, even if you're wrong, but you predict something really hard to predict and you're off by a little, that could also give you positive utility, right? So I'm not trying to say here that all of this is negative utility. I was just showing that higher values on the y-axis is less utility instead of more. Cool, thanks. Yeah, sorry, Berkeley. I know you're getting interrupted a lot, and maybe your answer is look at my studies. But there's a lot of clamoring in the Q and A about uh, some context for errors here, and I agree. I, I just can't imagine having like one function over error because it depends on what errors mean. If, if four error is you die, I, I'm going to bet that is more than twice as bad as two error, right? Uh, what kind of errors? I, I can't imagine having like one loss function without reference to like what kind of problem we're dealing with. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. So when we're looking at different penalty functions, we've done this in a couple of cases. I think it's completely context dependent, right? If you're making a prediction that's on a five point scale, an error of two means something really different than if you're making a prediction on a thousand point scale, for example. And also, like you said, there, it could just be really different depending on the context. And so for this project, we're not saying this is the penalty function that people have, right? That's absolutely not the claim we're making. This is just our basis for thinking that people are generally probably going to be pretty risk seeking over air, right? So we've run a lot of studies with this other paper suggesting that people have this diminishing sensitivity and that makes you risk seeking. And so all I want you to take away is that we think people will be relatively risk seeking over air. That could be really different in some contexts though. You could find contexts where they're not. The point of this paper is just that the air matters. So we're gonna run studies where it's a purely monetary gamble, it's purely prediction or it's both. And we think that whether or not there's air is going to matter, I completely agree in different contexts, your penalty function could be different. The way that air affects you could be different. Our point is it's consequential and it should change your preferences, but it could do so differently in a different context, if that makes sense. All right. So our two hypotheses, one, 
right? People are sensitive to the prediction errors generated in decisions under risk, right? So if we modify a purely monetary abstracted decision under risk to where the prospects and outcomes are tied to future states of the world, we think that people's preferences might change. And we think it's specifically because they're valuing the air itself, right? So we think that people might value the air itself independent of material outcomes, and then somehow integrate their valuation of air with material outcomes to come up with their overall preference, right? And Lynn and I are working on how might they do that. We have one potential model, but still working on it. Um, and two, we think because of past work showing people have this diminishing sensitivity to air that makes them risk seeking, when you modify purely monetary gambles to produce airs, we think it'll make people more risk seeking, right? Because people are so risk seeking over air. So when you take a purely monetary gamble and now make it a prediction problem as well and make it generate air, we expect to generally see people get more risk seeking. But most important to us is that the air can actually change people's preferences and they don't just care about the monetary or material outcomes. So just as a note before we jump into studies, um, we just posted the latest draft of our paper on SSRN and that's linked on my website. So if you're interested in that, you can go ahead and check out that paper. In that paper, you'll see a link to our OSF site that has pre-registrations for all the studies, all the materials, all the data, all the code. And so if you want any details or see anything that I didn't get to today, that's all there for you online. Uh, it's on OSF now, research box coming soon. So we're, we're working on that as well. Great, thumbs up from Joe. Uh, all right, study one. Study one is just our preliminary look at this. Let's see if there's any promise to this idea, right? So a bunch of MTurk participants, participants are going to choose between a safe and risky prospect betting on a coin flip. And we're going to manipulate whether their prospect is tied to a future state of the world, right? So we're going to make it either an abstracted prospect or make it clear what future state of the world is going to lead to a gain or a loss. And I'll show you that on the next slide. And the way I really want to think about this first study is this is a really simple design to get preliminary evidence regarding whether tying prospects to a future state of the world can change risk preferences. I don't think it's going to answer all our questions. And then I have a number of other studies that hopefully carry us forward. But this is just a probe into, are you going to see any evidence that tying prospects to a future state of the world is going to change people's risk preference here? So participants are assigned to one of three conditions. Um, in the gain condition, participants only realize this material outcome and their prospects are not tied to future states of the world. So participants have this choice, and this is not the way that it's shown to participants. This is just a brief summary for you. If you choose prospect A, you get a 50% chance of gaining 30 cents. That's the riskier prospect. If you choose prospect B, you get 12 cents for sure, 100%. And these are real incentives that you get on MTurk uh, depending on what happens. And participants learn, after you make your choice, the computer will flip a coin to determine how much you earn. In the heads condition, now we're going to tie the risky prospect to a future state of the world. Right, so participants learn, they're going to get 30 cents if the coin lands on heads, if they choose prospect A, and we go ahead and tell them that's a 50% chance to 30 cents in case they don't know how coins work. And, or you could accept um, 12 cents for sure, no matter what, no matter what the coin does. So 12 cents with 100% probability. In the choice condition, it's really similar, but now it's not just heads, you can choose what side of the coin to bet on. So you're gonna get 30 cents if whatever side of the coin you choose comes up. Um, 30, and then we tell them that's 30 cents with a 50% probability, or you can get 12 cents for sure, right? So the monetary prospect between all these is the same. We think the big difference is we tied the risky prospect to a future state of the world in the heads and choice condition. Let's see if people made the risky choice more often. So let's look at the results here. All the graphs I'm going to show you, what the graph is, is it's the percentage of participants choosing the safer prospect. So in this case, it's the percent of people choosing that 12 cents for sure. Uh, and we have the gain, heads, and choice conditions below the bottom here. What we see is in the gain condition, where it's just this abstracted gamble, prospects aren't same, uh, tied to future states of the world. 44% of people chose the safe option of 12 cents for sure. Um, significantly fewer people chose the safe option. So more people took risk in this heads condition where in the risky prospect, you'll get the money if it lands on heads. 
And also significantly more people than the gain condition chose the riskier prospect and the choice condition where you could choose what side of the coin to bet on, right? So both the heads and choice condition, the gray bars are significantly different from the gain condition, the white bar, but the two gray bars aren't significantly different from each other, right? Now there is a little effect there. So it seems like people may even take more risk when they're able to choose whatever outcome they want, right? So there might be an additional marginal effect of getting to choose or getting to pick the specific outcome. But I think the heads condition is a very preliminary evidence that this isn't all about picking your favorite outcome. This is just about tying prospects to future states of the world. Now, I don't expect you to be completely convinced of that yet. Very preliminary evidence. I think study four is our best evidence for that. So if you're still wondering about it, uh, hold on till study four. Berkeley? Berkeley. Yes. Okay, go ahead, Leif. It's, mine's a tiny question. Um, I assume the Amtrak workers, uh, my guess is that most of them think that you're lying to them about everything that's involved. The, okay. If that's true, then uh, the differential phrasing of the, of the setup would lead to different beliefs about what type of lie you're telling them. And so anytime there's a coin flip that's happening off screen, that sounds like it's going to be in a weird category where maybe they'll build in a new theory. And so I'm just wondering if there's if they believe different narratives behind the deception that they might they might express different preferences over over those. I think that's completely possible. And so I think that's a concern you could absolutely have where if I, I mean, all the coin flips are going to be off screen, but they might not know that. And so um, participants could be thinking we're lying to them in different ways. The way we're really going to address that in study four, I think that's gonna be the key study that probably addresses a number of concerns, hopefully, is just show participants different distributions of outcomes and have them pick the different distribution that they like the most, just given experience. And so instead of giving people a setup where there's a coin flip or something, and then having them trust us. We're just going to show them a bunch of draws of outcomes and then tell us which distribution of outcomes they like the most. And so I think that future, that future study is going to be the one that addresses this and probably a lot of other questions. Um, let me know if it does. Um, uh, oh, sorry, Joe. Sorry. sorry. Um, so I had a question about how your theory predict, the, the, the heads condition is a little bit puzzling to me because I, I get that if you have diminishing sensitivity, that increase that that implies risk seeking in this circumstance. But that alone is that alone shouldn't increase risk taking because I, if it's just diminishing sensitivity, but all the utility is negative, mm -hmm. then it, it it shouldn't matter. Like they should still be like less inclined. So you need to sort of posit that there's some there's some kind of positive utility. That people are expecting to get out of it now that it's heads, and I'm wondering if you think about it as like rooting interest. It's, I mean, it could it could also be some MTurk stuff that Leif talked about, but like you can imagine in in, in both the in both the right two bars there, you have some some amount of rooting interest, like you're rooting for heads, and now it, and now it sort of becomes maybe more because you, you need some positive utility. I mean, that that's sort of my my point. Like you have to be thinking about it that way, no? Absolutely. No, I, I completely agree. So I think this example is a little far from the one I showed you with the penalty function. And the next study is going to be a lot more like that. I think my interpretation of what's going on here is that absolutely in expectation, betting on the coin flip gives you positive utility where you're, the utility you'll get if you're right outweighs the utility you'll lose or not. You know, you'll get less utility if you're wrong. And in the net, people like betting on the coin flip. And so I absolutely think this study is showing some evidence consistent with what we found when we look at these penalty functions that people get a lot of positive utility out of being right, and that can outweigh the slight negative utility for being wrong. And so I completely agree. But in the heads condition, they're not right. It was picked for them. Well, they're right because they chose to bet on that, right? So they could have chosen not to bet on the coin flip. I they see, could say, see. I want the 12 cents for sure. I'm not going to bet on the coin flip. If they opt into the coin flip, and bet on heads and then heads turns up, now your future state of the world is realized and you get that utility. That would be what our theory says. Okay. Right, so just like when you have an investment manager that invests your money for you, even though you're not making 
those decisions yourself, you're still going to realize the gains or losses to your portfolio. Here, when you, even if you're not choosing the outcome, when an error is generated and you had some part in it, you're going to realize that error um, would be the way we think about it. All right, let's go to the next study. This one's getting a little bit closer to the example I showed, and it's, I think the diminishing sensitivity is going to more come into play here. Once again, participants are choosing between safe and risky options bang on a coin flip, but this time the safe prospect is not going to be opting out of the bet of the coin flip. So we're going to have a high level of error, a low level of error, and a medium level of error. And participants, the safe option is going to be accepting the medium level of error for sure. And so all participants are going to be realizing error on the coin flip, no matter what they choose. And I think the second change that's pretty interesting is adding a new condition that I think is pretty important. So we're still gonna have this gain condition where it's purely monetary and outcomes are not tied to future states of the world. So you don't learn how the prospect is tied to the coin flip. We're also going to add an error condition that's just what do you want to bet on the coin flip with no material outcome or no stakes. So we're going to learn what are people's preferences for betting on this coin flip. Um, what's your preference over air essentially. And then we're going to have the both gain and air condition where it's both. You're going to bet on this coin flip and it's going to have stakes. And so what we expect to see here is people have one risk preference when they're just realizing gains. They have another risk preference when they're just realizing error. They're perhaps the most risk-seeking. And then when they're realizing both of these, they might fall somewhere in the middle and aggregate their preference for both of them. And so in the gain condition, it looks very similar to the last study, almost the same thing, right? So you have a choice between three prospects here instead of two. Two of them are pretty much identical and you'll see why that is, right? So if you choose A, you have a 50% chance to gain 30 cents and a 50% chance to gain nothing. B is the same thing, a 50% chance to gain 30 cents, 50% chance to gain nothing. Or if you choose C, you get 12 cents per share. And all participants learn after you make your choice, the computer will flip a coin to determine how much you earned. Then participants just simply make this choice between A, B, and C, these different distributions of gains. In the gain and error condition, now we're going to tell people about the coin flip and make it clear how the coin flip is going to generate these outcomes. Right, so participants learn there's a coin with zero painted on one side and two painted on the other side. You're going to predict the outcome of the coin flip in terms of what number it will land on, right? So your bonus depends on your prediction. If your prediction is perfect, you get 30 cents. If your prediction's off by one, you get 12 cents. And if your prediction's off by two, you get nothing, right? And now you can see how betting on this coin flip and choosing one of these outcomes perfectly creates this risky choice on the, uh, in the gain condition. So if you predict zero, you have a 50% chance to be perfect and a 50% chance to be off by two. If you predict two, you have a 50% chance to be perfect and a 50% chance to be off by two. And if you predict one, you're going to gain 12 cents for sure, because for sure you're going to be off by one, right? And then when we have people choose between these, we tell them, you know, predict one, two, or zero, but we do everything we can to frame this in terms of the distributions of gains you can realize, right? So we want to give participants every opportunity to say, all I care about is the distributions of gains. I don't really care about prediction error or the coin flip thing you told me about. Just give me the distribution of gains that I prefer. And then in the error condition, um, same thing without the material stakes. So they learn there's a coin with zero on one side and two on the other side. What would you want to predict? Would you want to predict zero and have a 50% chance of being right, 50% chance of being off by two? Same thing with predicting two. Or would you want to predict one and be off by one for sure? Um, so let's look at the results. And then they just choose among those outcomes, right? So I think this condition is neat because it's just going to tell us what are participants' preferences over this distribution of forecasting error, right? Would you rather accept the error of one for sure or have a 50% chance of being right and a 50% chance of being off by two, right? So I think everyone might have the strong intuition. Of course, you want to predict zero or two because you want some chance of being right. You don't want to be off by one for sure. Um, hopefully that intuition lines up with people being receiving over error. Of note, something like an OLS regression that minimizes squared error would actually want to predict one. So let's see uh, what participants chose in each condition. Uh, we got kind of the results that we were expecting here, where in the gain condition, about half of participants chose this 
safe prospect of the 12 cents for sure. In the air condition, participants told us that they would like to bet on zero or two. Only 19% of participants chose the safe option of betting on one and being off by one for sure. And then those participants in the gain and air condition fell somewhere in between, right? So these participants fell significantly in between these other bars. And this is at least some evidence consistent with the notion or could be that people have some valuation of the gains they realize, they have some valuation of the air and their valuation of the whole prospect when they realize gains in air falls somewhere in the middle, right? And they aggregate these. And if material outcomes and these gains are the only things that people care about and the only thing that affect their utility, um, we would hope that participants in the gain and air condition would tell us, I just care about the distributions of gains and make an identical choice to those participants in the gain condition. Go ahead, Uma, do you have a question? Yeah, Berkeley. Um, so this is very cool because I, if I'm interpreting this correctly, you basically gave people a certainty equivalent for error in the error condition. Um, I guess with a tiny bit of flavor of Leif's prior question, I, I, would you expect this to be sort of modulated by by people's by the volatility volatility of the world, right? So like a coin flip is really helpful because inherently, even with deception, we we sort of our default is that it's fair. But if you know, I like in foraging models in in all of these models where people use prediction error post hoc, like as opposed to in anticipation. There's a lot of, of, of questions about like how reliable is the environment itself? And I, I kind of wanted to just confirm, I, I think what you're showing here is that, that these, these outcomes might change if you thought the environment itself could change, right? That there was volatility in the environment. I think so, yeah. So I think we're assuming that's not the case here in this study. And I think it could be different in that case, absolutely. So I think there's one important alternative explanation to address here. We're going to do a really similar study that I, I hope addresses it. So one thing you could ra raise is that people might not want to bet on one because one wasn't an outcome of the coin flip and it has no probability of occurring, right? So people simply might not ever want to bet on an outcome that has no chance of occurring. And so maybe we kind of fix things in our favor in that study because betting on one is just not a realistic thing, right? So let's try to do something very, very similar where now all the outcomes have a positive probability of occurring, right? So now we're gonna do a die roll where there's more levels of outcomes in a very similar study where it's completely going to be predicting the outcome of the die roll and realizing error, completely realizing gains or both predicting a die roll that results in material outcomes. So in the gain condition, um, participants had a riskier prospect that gave them a 40% chance of the best outcome, which is 30 cents, a 20% chance of the middle outcome, which is 10 cents, and a 40% chance of gaining nothing. They had a relatively safe prospect, which offered them only a 20% chance of the best outcome, which is 30 cents, but now an 80% chance of the middle outcome, which is 10 cents, and no probability of gaining nothing, right? So these both have the same expected value of 14 cents. B has lower variance in earnings, and so risk averse person should probably pick B. And then we'll have a prospect C that's identical to A where um, they have the same chances of getting the best middle and worst outcome. And like the last study, participants learned that after you make your choice, the computer will roll a die to determine how much you earned. In the gain and air condition, now we tell people about the die roll and tie these outcomes to future states of the world where there's going to be a five-sided die that has the numbers one, one, two, three, three painted on it. So a five-sided die is not a made up thing. If people have asked me that, you can Google it. It's a real type of die. They learn that they'll get 30 cents if they're perfect, 10 cents if they're off by one and nothing if they're off by two, right? And now betting on one, two, and three in this die roll produces these prospects that you see for the gain condition, right? So predicting one gives you a 40% chance to be perfect, a 20% chance to be off by one, and a 40% chance to be off by two, for example. And predicting two gives you a 20% chance of being perfect, but an 80% chance of being off by one, right? So now we've done a very similar thing to the last study, but all outcomes have a positive probability of occurring. So you can bet on two without feeling bad about it because two has no chance of coming up on the die. And then of course, in the air condition, people are just telling us 
what are your preferences when betting on this die roll with no monetary incentive, right? So would you want to predict one, two, or three with the specific die? And once again, in the gain and error condition, we're trying to frame things really similarly to the gain condition because we want to be conservative here and give participants every chance to tell us we don't care about error or this prediction. We just care about the distribution of gains. And so let me just pick the distribution of gains that I like the most. So let's look at the percent of participants picking the safer prospects in each condition. Um, once again, we see very similar results to the last one where in the gain condition, participants are relatively likely to pick the safe prospect that offers them no chance of gaining zero money, uh, zero dollars. In the air condition, a quarter of participants want to bet on two on the die roll. Most people want to take one of the riskier prospects where they have a higher probability of being right, but also a higher probability of being off by two. And those participants in the gain and air condition fall significantly in between the other two, right? As if they were aggregating their risk preference over air and their risk preference over gain some way. So their preference over the whole prospect falls somewhere in the middle, right? So we think, uh, yes, yeah, go ahead. It's my like cutting. Okay, I didn't mean to cut. Um, I love you like a brother. You know that. I, just this uh, this risk preference over errors thing is driving me insane. Okay. And I'm, I'm I apologize for being so rude about it. But look, this is entirely a function of whatever arbitrary numbers you stick on the sides of the randomizing device, right? The the coin could have been labeled zero a million and 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 doing nothing is one, right? Or the coin could have been labeled 0, 1.1 and doing nothing is one. And now your risk preference is, is convex, not concave, right? I'm not sure I completely agree with that. I think- Like depending like on, saying, depending on whether I- function, What I mean to say is- It's probably really yeah. different depending on what you're betting on. And so I think with these different no. dice, with these different I, contexts, Right, well, I'm saying if, if you're picking numbers so such that the doing nothing option or the middle option is right between uh, the, 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 you know, like the, let's go to the coin because it's simpler, zero and two, and you're calling doing nothing one. Doing nothing could have been 1.9. It could have been 0. 0.0001. And depending mm -hmm. on what number you assign to it, you're going to get convexity or concavity. It's, it's, it's purely a function of how you decided set the numbers, but I don't think it's going to matter in terms of the behavior, but I could be wrong, uh, you know, but right? like it, it's not the case that you can say that people are, are concave over these errors because you're rigging it that way, so to speak. Rigging is, a, is, a, is an ugly word, sorry, but you, you, you follow so I think, me. I mean, I follow you. Let's take a step back then and just say I, I absolutely think you got different penalty functions when we label, when you're in a different context or we label these differently. Let's just take a step back then and say here that what we're showing is that even with a penalty function, you can imagine a simple penalty function of being right or wrong. And so it's just binary. Tying these prospects to future state of the world matters and it changes people's preferences, right? It changes their risk preference. So even with a really simple binary preference function, let's say, you get some positive utility out of being right. Maybe you get less negative utility out of being wrong, for example. Tying prospects to future state of the world and making these predictions changes people's risk preferences. If we can agree on that, I'll be happy. If you don't buy my penalty functions, I can work more on that. But I think so far, that's I'm hopefully we can agree on that much. All right. That's better. And then, yeah. OK, and then we can, we'll work more to convince you of the second part later. Um, maybe not get to it today. So let's skip this. So I think one, one positive thing about the stimuli so far and something I like is in those gain conditions, the stimuli really look like the classic decisions under risk that we've seen a lot, right? Distributions of gains. And so I think emulating a lot of that old research and those old studies is a big positive, but I think the way we've made these studies uh, leaves open some alternative accounts, right? That are not our account of what's going on. So I think one thing you could be worried about is in the air conditions, participants may have felt very illusory control. So when you know how this is going to play out and you know how the outcomes are generated, the literature on illusory control might say that 
you have a greater feeling that you can control these outcomes. Um, and so that's one potential difference, right? The gain conditions may have felt relatively ignorant or that some features were unexplained. So I think this goes along with Leif's concern that he explained earlier, or to the extent that people choose between these by simulating outcomes, maybe people have an easier time simulating outcomes once we tie prospects to future states of the world. The last one's a little complicated, but bear with me, right? So in the gain and error condition, people may have anticipated more regret from choosing the safe option if they anticipated that they would have learned the outcome of the die roll or the coin flip, then they'd be able to infer that they could know what they would have earned if they would have chosen the risky option and had regret if they learned, oh man, if I would have picked that risky option, I could have gotten the best outcome. And so that anticipated regret could have kept people from, could have kept people from picking the safe option in that condition. So, the point is, I think there's still alternative concerns here, and maybe our account isn't the only one you have in your mind for these results. And so I'm going to show you our study four, which I think is the, the best study we have for ruling out some of these alternative explanations. Right, so in this one, participants are simply just going to choose between two different forecasting methods. So participants aren't producing errors themselves. They're not making these decisions. They're choosing between two different methods that are going to realize outcomes for them. Once again, we're manipulating whether they see errors, gains, or both errors and gains. And the differences with the previous studies, one, right, participants aren't making these predictions themselves. We're just going to show them distributions of outcomes in practice and then have them tell us what distribution of outcome they like the most. And participants are only going to learn about outcomes and probabilities through experience, right? So we're not going to have the setup where we tell you there's a die roll and you have to believe us. We're just going to show you 20 samples of outcomes and have you think about which samples of outcomes you like the most. So we think that this study at least helps to alleviate some of these concerns about differential, illusory control, anticipated regret, or in understanding across conditions. So let's quickly look at what the study looked like. So in all conditions, participants learned you're going to choose between two options, E and S, that generate bonuses or predictions. First, you're going to see option ENS perform in 20 practice trials. And then you're going to choose between option ENS for one official trial that really counts. Um, in the prediction frame, so participants in the air and gain and air conditions learn this. They learn that option ENS use three inputs that are zero to 10 to produce an outcome that's from zero to 10. In the gain condition, they learn just that option ENS I'm sorry, in the gain and gain and air conditions, they learned that option ENS generate bonuses up to 50 cents. So they learned about the material outcomes, right? And only in the gain and air condition do they learn about the mapping of air onto material outcomes. So if the option you pick is perfect, you get 50 cents. If it's off by one, you get 40 cents and so on, losing 10 cents for each unit of air. Now what's going on behind the scenes to generate outcomes is the same in all the conditions. Right, so what's going on is three random numbers are selected that are all discrete, um, uniform numbers from zero to 10. So for example, four, six, and three could be selected. The correct answer is a linear combination of those plus a random number that's either negative one or one, all random to a whole number, right? So given these inputs of four, six, and three, the correct answer would either be three or five. Option E is a prediction method that uses that same linear combination without the random component. So option E would always predict four, would give in four, six, and three, right? So it's always off by one, and it's always going to earn you 40 cents. Option S uses the same exact equation as the answer, but its random component is independent. So half the time it's going to match, it'll be perfect and it'll earn you 50 cents. Half the time it's going to be off by two, and it'll earn you 30 cents, right? So it would predict either three or five with equal probability given these inputs of four, six, and three. So if you find this confusing at all, don't worry about it. All you need to know is that we generated a forecasting task that made a safe option that's always off by one and always gives you 40 cents and a risky option that's equally likely to be off by zero and two and equally likely to give you 50 or 30 cents. So let's see what participants actually saw because the framing of this was different depending on the condition. In the air condition, participants saw 20 trials of the inputs, what the correct answer was, 
and what the predictions were, right? So they're just going to see 20 trials of what these predictions were and how far off they were. So over 20 trials, they're going to learn that option E is always off by one and option S is equally likely to be perfect and off by two. In the gain condition, they're just going to see 20 samples of the material outcomes they realize, right? So they're going to see just 20 examples of the gains they get from picking either option. So they're gonna learn over 20 trials that E always gives them 40 cents and S is equally likely to give them 30 and 50 cents. And in the gain and error condition, they're going to see all of this. So they're going to go through 20 samples where they see the correct answer, the prediction each one made, and then the resulting money that they earned. So they're gonna learn through 20 trials that E is always off by one and always gives them 40 cents. And um, S is off by zero or two and gives them 30 or 50 cents, right? So what we like about this is that our goal in running the study was to just show people distributions of outcomes in terms of gains, error, or both gains and error, and then tell us which distribution of outcomes do you wanna pick? So let's see what participants chose. Um, and we actually got results very similar to our previous studies. So in the gain condition, participants were the most likely to pick the 40 cents for sure. So they told us most often that they want the 40 cents for sure, they don't want a 50% chance of 30 and 50 cents. In the error condition, when participants are just expressing their preferences over these predictions, they're saying that they'd rather have the option that has 50% chance of being perfect over the one that's always off by one. And in the gain and error condition, where these two things are combined, their risk preference falls in the middle. Right? So I think this is at least so far our most solid evidence that people might have evaluation over error, evaluation over gains, and then when they realize both, they might value both and their risk preference might fall somewhere in the middle. So it looks like we have about five minutes left. Let me, let me wrap up here. And I'll of course welcome any comments if you have them, All right? So what are our conclusions, All right? It seems like we can at least say that people might take more risk when prospects are tied to future states of the world, All right? And I've told you our account is that we, people, we believe that people do this because we think they value prediction error as a consequential outcome decision as a risk and their risk seeking over prediction error, right? So we might have still more, more work to do convincing people on that one. Uh, the last point is from a couple studies that I haven't gotten to show you, but I think this actually has really neat implications that are worth discussing for a minute, right? So one that I think is important to think about is that people's risk preferences and abstracted monetary gambles, right? Like the ones that we traditionally use in the literature may not represent the risk preferences in the real world. So if you buy our proposition that in the real world, you're not just buying distributions of gains and losses, but you're actually picking a future state of the world, then these abstracted monetary gambles where you're just choosing distributions of gains and losses could differ from real world prospects in an important way and lead to different risk preferences and choices, right? And these stimuli are very popular. They're gonna be in a lot of the famous papers on decision under risk that we see. So it's worth at least considering and thinking about, might we wanna more closely emulate the real world if we wanna learn people's risk preferences in the real world? And so it looks like these could potentially systematically underestimate people's real world risk preferences. And this could be really problematic if we use them for really consequential decisions, right? So if we use them to learn people's risk preferences to make investments. And unfortunately, I think this is something that's actually happening. So these are two items from real surveys that investment managers use to assess people's risk preferences. And then the idea is they take those risk preferences and use that when they're investing their clients' money in the market, right? So these are these kind of purely monetary decisions under risk where outcomes are not tied to future states of the world. And so you could be concerned, might these kind of items estimate that people are more risk averse than they really are? And might we not um, then take enough risk when we're investing this person's money in the market? In addition, I think this could relate to how often in data we'd see that people look really risk averse in the lab, right? So we have people make basic decisions under risk in the lab. They often look extremely, extremely risk averse. And out in the real world, we often see people taking big risks. So there's multiple explanations for why this could be, but I think this could be another potential one where in the real world, decisions under risk are also prediction problems where people might naturally take more risk. Right, so when I'm opening 
a new business and I'm an entrepreneur, I'm not just thinking about the distributions of gains and losses, I'm making a specific prediction. And so that could be some mapping of what we've done onto traditional decisions under risk. Right, and then finally, they think they apply that we might actually be able to manipulate people's risk preferences by manipulating how much decisions under risk look like predictions versus um, classic choices over distributions of gains and losses, right? So for example, if we think people are gambling too much and taking too much risk, we might wanna frame um, gambling not as just predictions, like which team do you think will win, but make it more salient what the distributions of gains and losses you're picking are. Um, and so I think this could apply to also investing and things like uncertain incentives, which I'd be interested in looking at as well. So it looks like we have a couple of questions left. I'll see if there's any other comments or questions. So, so I have a- oh. go, ahead. No, go ahead, Ellen, you go first. So I'm wondering basically like a different way to frame what you found so far is maybe that people get more value out, out of being right for X amount of cents than being uh, wrong for Y amounts of cents, whatever. Mm -hmm. And you assume that this effect is independent of the outcomes. And I wonder if you expect the same effects to happen for these really, really big investments, right? Where it's like, hey, do I bet a million on this risky prospect or like mm -hmm. 800,000 on a safe prospect? Uh, because intuitively, I could see the value function change there. Yeah, absolutely. So I didn't have enough time to really present this. But we had a study where we manipulated stakes to see does this only happen for the really small stakes decisions and you can see the details on the paper if you want but even when we crank these stakes up to be bigger and bigger we're still finding this effect where when they're tied to future states of the world people are significantly less likely to pick a safe prospect and so that's that's our best guess given the data we collected Joe, uh, that fun? perfectly addresses my question thing yeah, I was, I'm just trying to think about other ways to sort of test your theory. Like, I, I think it would, basically the idea is that there's there's gotta be some positive utility from being right. And so it feels like you could then, you could then make predictions about what kinds of tasks people are gonna be more risk seeking on. Because for some kinds of prediction tasks, people might be way less likely to be right. Like if they have to predict a point estimate of something, that's really hard to predict, they might be pretty risk averse in doing that. But if they just have to predict a binary outcome, um, then they might, be more, they might be more inclined to do that. I mean, I know, I know it sort of conflates the probability, but so there might not be a, a way to cleanly test that, but I'm wondering if, if maybe you, you might be able to use this theory to say something about the kinds of tasks. Like if you walk around a casino, like, some tasks are like some kinds of gambles are really popular and some kinds of gambles are unpopular. And obviously it could be because of the payoffs and the probabilities, but I'm wondering if, if your theory might be able to say something about something else about why some otherwise equivalent tasks might be more or less popular to bet on. Yeah, that'd be really interesting. So I don't think the specific studies I've shown you today really speak to that so much because we'd probably say it depends on your penalty function for that task. And so I think one thing that could be tricky that would happen is if you're making a point estimate on a really wide interval, you could consider it a success if you get even close, right? So if you're predicting something on a million point interval and you're within a hundred, you might consider that a win or get a lot of positive utility, even though you got the point estimate wrong. But I'd really like your idea. And I think absolutely one way you could carry this forward is thinking about, are there different types of bets or tasks where people are thinking about they get more utility out of being right or have a different probability of, of being right, or at least feel more like they're able to be right. And could that predict when they want to participate in one of these risky decisions or not? I think that's a great thing to think about. Cool. Thank, thanks so much, Berkeley, for such an interesting talk. And thanks to all of our panelists for being so engaged uh, and for all of our audience members who have submitted a bundle of comments and questions to us. Uh, great all around. Uh, and I hope you have a chance to join us again. We'll be back next week, but uh, enjoy your weekends. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.